um, it's really, it's, it's very good to be with you all. So, why don't we pray? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. From the Gospel of John, Jesus said to his disciples, Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, because without me you can do nothing. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask your Holy Spirit to be upon us. Pour forth the spirit of wisdom and understanding, courage and knowledge, wonder and awe in your presence, and delight in the fear of the Lord. Help us to understand the power and gifts of your Holy Spirit, the invitation that you give to each one of us to live lives of prayer and virtue and service. Mother Mary, we ask you, along with St. Joseph, St. Gabriel, and all the holy angels, archangels, and saints, to pray for us. For we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, Denise and Joe, is Joe back there? Can you summon her forth? Because <laughs> that's a normal way of talking. <laughs> Could somebody summon Joe? Thank you. I'd like to thank Denise and Joe, and also Karen. Karen, if you could raise your hand. Um, they've prepared this, this wonderful hospitality, uh, all the food and drink and everything like that. So, thank you. And if I didn't just call your name, well, you didn't tell me that what you did. So there it is. Uh, so that's, that's that. Yes. Val and Lou, raise your hand. Oh. Awesome. Oh. Okay, thank you. And Rachel providing her child coordinator. And Rachel coordinated our child care. The children are running them up out there. <laughs> Anybody else? No, I'm just <laughs> I'd like to thank the establishment and their okay. Um, Jesus is the vine, we're the branches. Does anybody have a question about that? Good, that's an important <laughs> distinction. Um, what we're gonna do tonight, we'll review uh, the universal calls and the four ways of prayer and have a little time to reflect on those together. And then we'll dive into uh, the main uh, topic of, of tonight, um, starting with uh, who the Holy Spirit is, uh, the, the advocate and the Lord, the giver of life, um, contrasting him with uh, what, what the scriptures call, um, or the, the evil one, who the scriptures call the accuser. And so in the writings of St. John, we have uh, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, and then the accuser. And um, that's going to come into play later on. St. Paul's teaching on the body of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, the gifts and the fruits and the charisms, and then talking about uh, how to discern which charism, um, what charisms the Lord has given to, to each one of us. And then, just like we did last week, and what I would suggest the Holy Spirit is constantly doing um, in one way or another, whether we know it or not, and whether we like it or not, apply it all to the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another as I have loved you. Um, we, we are very talented as uh, humans in that we can separate most things from the command of love in one way or another. And um, so the Lord, I feel like, is always working to bring us, bring us back, uh, back to that. Uh, I do have, a, a, again, a resource sheet for you, incomplete resource sheet, and um, we'll go over that. Uh, before we close out with prayer. I know that this is a lot. And this week we're going to have a little more bite size. A um, little more. And this week we're going to have a little more discussion and reflection time. 
Um, something that the Lord has consistently done in, in my life um, has been to open my eyes to how vast his store of wisdom is and, and how much he has to offer me and to teach me. And some of that is um, knowledge in my head, and some of that is knowledge in my heart, and some of that are, are, are things that, that I've learned and used before, um, but I've not learned them or used them in this specific part of my life. And so to learn them again or in a new way, um, I know that this is a lot. And like I said last week, um, something, something like, um, we're not going to cover it all, and there's no way you're going to get it all. Right? There's no way anybody, including me, are going to walk out. It's going to walk out here and say, "Well, I got that. What's the next thing?" Um, but we can we can very easily forget how vast is the, the wisdom and the knowledge and the love of God. And um, so to offer a lot, it's kind of like going back to the Italian theme. I don't know if I ever saw my mom actually do this. Um, I think I did. But when you're cooking spaghetti, right, you throw it against the wall, and I don't know, because you're mad at your kids or whatever. Anyway, <laughs> um, my mother never did that. Anyway, to, to see what's, uh, see if it's done, and you see what sticks, but you got to throw it all against the wall. And right? that's kind of what we're doing here. <laughs> There's a lot of spaghetti. And you just kind of see what sticks. And if there's something tonight or from last week or from um, the, the readings, the resources that sticks or that, that tugs at the heart or, or brings some light to the mind, well, go with that. Go with that. And so to go over last week, we have universal calls. And these are things that we're called to by virtue of our baptism. We're all called, because we've been baptized, to holiness, to prayer, to service, and to evangelization. We're all called to be saints. We're all called to be men and women of deep prayer. We're all called to some kind of service. And we're all called to proclaim the gospel by word and by action and example. All of us. Now, for each of us, that's going to look differently, or that's going to look different. We are all called to holiness. We're all called to be filled with love of God and love of neighbor. The basics of that are the Ten Commandments. So at no point can anybody say, you know what? God gave those Ten Commandments, but I've done some personal discernment, and I really don't think that uh, I have to follow all of them. Right? So maybe most of them, but not all of them. I really, you know, God gave the ten and they're for everybody, but I've personally thought about it. Right? That's that's not in accord. I mean that's not a lot of things, but like seeing. But that's also not in accord with what Jesus teaches as part of the definition to be a disciple. Right? So if I'm gonna to claim to be a Catholic Christian disciple, this is all part of it. Like the call to holiness, the call to virtue, the call to love. Uh, we're all called to prayer. We're not all called to prayer like cloistered nuns. Cloistered nuns are called to prayer like cloistered nuns. Uh, but we're all called to prayer and deep and personal and daily prayer. That's going to look different. Um, for me, the best example of that is the difference between me and my sister Joanna. Joanna has five children, age 1 to 11. Joanna is called to daily personal prayer. Joanna is called to daily personal prayer in a different way than I am because I'm a celibate man, right? <laughs> Who, like, you know, it's just like our lives look very differently in, 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 in many different ways. Uh, but we're both, called to, we're both called to prayer. We're all called to serve. We can get out of this sometimes in our minds by saying, well, you know what? I'm not called to be Mother Teresa. I wonder if you're not. Maybe, in one way or another. But that's like saying, I'm not called to be a cloister nun, so I'm not going to really put any muscle in prayer. Yeah. 
we can get try to get out of this stuff all we want. But, um, and also evangelization. Well, what you want me to stand on that street corner and like stand up on a soapbox and wave my Bible on them? Probably not. But it would probably be good to tell the people you love about what you get out of church. It's crazy as that sounds. Well, what if they think we're judgmental? Well, prove them wrong. Prove them wrong. That all working into us all being called to prayer in the four very basic ways of prayer. Uh, personal prayer, that's when it's Kind of the main players are just me and God. Uh, communal prayer where two or three are gathered in his name. Spontaneous prayer, prayer that we make up uh, from our own mind or our own heart. Or a, a ritual prayer, prayer that's already formed and already, um, already written uh, and handed down to us. Uh, for example, the Our Father. Um, and so what I like to do is take a minute or two and we're just going to pause and quiet and then we'll take uh, five to seven or ten ish we'll just kind of see how it goes uh, minutes um, to talk to the people at your at your table um, with the question just a general question what stands out as especially important or challenging like all of these things are doorways that we can go into all these things are places that we can go into in a deeper way um, and so they're going to hit us in one way or another. But what stands out is especially important or challenging. So a minute or so of quiet, and then I'll, I'll let you know when to start discussing. Just like with the information, whether me giving or you receiving or all of us processing, um, it, it cannot stop here. Like one of the one of the whole points is to stir our hearts to dive in after we after we leave. And the same thing with the discussion. To, to continue the conversation with each other, like um, or however that works, continue the conversation. The Holy Spirit. We call the Holy Spirit in the Creed the Lord, the Giver of Life. And we see in various ways in the Scripture that the Holy Spirit is the one who creates the people of God. And creates the people of God. And whether that's throughout. Um, the different parts of salvation history, preparing for Christ, the various covenants and everything like this. We see the work of the Holy Spirit creating the people of God, uh, and then the Holy Spirit creating the church. Creating the church. Celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, and we see how the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles and Mary and the disciples, and the church was born. It's the creation of, um, or the, the work of the Holy Spirit creating the, the church. And um, we also pray in one of the classic prayers, send forth your Holy Spirit and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Right. Who's the they in that? It's us. Not just the creation of who we are as human persons, that's part of it, but to create us and then to recreate us um, into who God has made us to be. And that is sons and daughters of the Father, uh, members of the body of Christ, the church, uh, to, to flourish for the sake of others, to, literally to make the world a better place. I mean, kind of a quaint saying, but yes, that's it. <laughs> um, and to build us up so that we become the men and women of prayer and charity that the Lord has called us to be in our, in our vocations. It's the constant work of, of the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. 
Again, in the writings of St. John, uh, we see the Holy Spirit called the advocate and the evil one called the accuser. The Holy Spirit called the advocate and the evil one called the accuser. And it's a good basic rule, follow the advocate, not the accuser. Everybody got that? Don't follow Satan. Good, okay, great. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad this is being recorded. <laughs> and hi to everybody playing at home. Um, the accuser. And when the, the Holy Spirit, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit con convicting us of sin. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, there's, there's first, even if it's very brief or very hidden, uh, the understanding of our dignity. It was the understanding of our dignity and that that sin is not becoming of someone made in the image and likeness of God. Now that doesn't mean it's fun. Anybody who has ever had any kind of real conviction of, whoa, I should not have done that. <laughs> that was not in accord with love of God, love of neighbor, laws of the state of Maryland, whatever. Like, uh, have some sort of conviction. Right? It's not a fun situation. It's not a fun experience. But there's, but there's hope. Again, even if it's if it's deep and hidden and we don't feel it, when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, there's hope. What's happening? The Holy Spirit is acting as our advocate. Yes, Your Honor, I know that my client probably is not what Jesus was talking about, but even that word advocate, yes, Your Honor, I know that my client did this really dumb thing, but he's good. He's good. Yes, there's stuff to work on, but he's, he's good. There's hope, there's dignity. The accuser, the accuser of our brothers, the devil is called in the book of Revelation, to accuse. Not like, I accuse you of doing this action, but you did this because you're bad. You're fundamentally bad. You did this because you're fundamentally selfish. That's who you are. You're defined by this. You've lost the image and likeness of God. There is no hope. This is who you are. The accuser. <coughs> We've got to look into our hearts because both, both of those voices, our hearts are very complicated, tumultuous, says the prophet Jeremiah. Tumultuous is the human heart. But when we listen for the voice of the advocate, even if it's the unpleasant experience of being convicted of sin, there's hope and dignity. The voice of the accuser wants to crush and blame and shame. And that's gonna come in, that's gonna come in pretty practically when we get to love of God and love of neighbor and applying these things. Um, because we, we say to ourselves and to one another all the time, and it's because you're bad. And it's because you're selfish. You're doing that thing because you're selfish. You're doing that thing because you're care. You're doing that thing because even though you have the veneer of something good every once in a while, you really are not. And it is rare, extremely rare. And that doesn't mean we don't sin. It's not like, oh, that means I can do whatever I want because I have good intentions. No, I guess it's, that's not the case. But when you, you dig in to the human heart made in the image and likeness of God, well, the accuser wants to crush that. And the advocate wants to purify, wants to 
convert and reorder and transform so that we live and become who we were made to be. St. Paul gives us the great analogy of the church as the body of Christ. The church as the body of Christ. And the many parts of the one body. And can the hand say to the foot, we don't need you? No. He says each, each person is a member of the body of Christ. And that has to do with our vocations. That has to do with how we're building up the church in the world. How we're loving and serving others. It also has to do with our individual backgrounds and experiences and wounds and fears and hopes and how we open our hearts and minds to let the Lord work in each one of us. And we build up the body of Christ. Each individual part is a member of the body, but distinct. You see that played out in something like, each one of us is called to prayer. Each one of us is called to prayer. But depending on which member of the body of Christ you are, well, it's going to look a little different. In basic catechism, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, piety, fear of the Lord, knowledge. Um, these are, when I say basic, that, that tends to make it seem simplistic, but I'm talking about fundamental. Like fundamental. The things we always have to go back to, the things that are part of us being made in the image and likeness of God, part of us being baptized um, in a complete way, in a way that the Holy Spirit pours himself out, um, that's what we receive at confirmation. Uh, but these are uh, the answers to the question, how do, I, how do I live? How do I live life according to the dignity which is mine? They're gifts. That means we can ask for them. I want to always emphasize that because we forget. Like, well, I don't have wisdom in this situation. What do I do? I don't have courage. And because I can't stir courage up within myself to do this thing, well, I guess I'm not going to do it. <laughs> ask for the gift of courage. We don't ask for courage because we already have courage. We ask for courage because we need it. I don't have the strength to do this. Yes. Okay. Ask. Fortitude. The fruits of the Holy Spirit, um, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's interesting that the Greek word is for long-suffering is the same as patient. Consider that. That's part of, part of what it means to be patient persevere in, in suffering, long suffering. That person's very patient. What happens? They can endure, they can forbear. They can forbear suffering. Now the fruits of the Holy Spirit are that which come um, from living life in the Holy Spirit. That which come from living and being filled and completely and continually <coughs> transformed and moved by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the fruit comes kind of at the end of the process. I'm no farmer, but I know. You don't just plant the seed and there, there it is. No, watery, the whole thing. Um, and then the, then the fruit comes. Okay, and so if, if I am living a life that is pursuing the Lord and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform me more and more into who I was created to be, I'm going to bear the fruit of love and joy and peace. 
Now, what that doesn't mean is you're not happy, you're not following Jesus. Right? That's not what it is. We're talking about this deep joy. Um, but it's also things that we can, it's also things that we can ask for them. We, that we can ask for, for the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Um, why? Because the Holy Spirit already has them. Like he wants to nurture them in us, of course, but the Holy Spirit already has them. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've asked for the fruit of peace, and whether in my own heart or just in the plans, in the plans of the day, like something of right order has emerged. Holy Spirit, give me peace, the fruit of peace. Right? It doesn't mean everything in my heart and soul, life, and calendar is magically well ordered. Yeah. But, Lord's kind of like, okay, I'll give you a there have been times that I've asked for the fruit of joy, and I've recognized that there's been something in my heart that I've let weigh me down, and, and I'm able to acknowledge that, and my heart is lifted. One time, I was going to visit some friends who were in the midst of a pretty intense suffering, and I asked for the gift of joy for the evening, or for the fruit of joy for the evening. Lord, give us the fruit of joy. And what didn't happen is that we all had this like deep insight into the providence of God and how everything was going to go fine, and there was this like deep spiritual freedom. That didn't happen. But at some point during dinner, somebody referred to a movie, a comedy that all of us had seen, and about forty-five minutes of laughter followed. It was Tommy Boy. Anyway, I'm just saying. Uh, but, and I knew that it was an answer to the prayer. And sometimes it's in the, I hate the height and the depth, and sometimes it's, Lord, we're trying here. Lift, lift the spirit. Right? And, and at the end of the meal, when we were all like, laughed out because we just needed it, it's not like we, we emerged like, oh, now I'm all the problems. Now, but what a, what a gift. Anyway, so watch Tommy Boy. I'm doomed. I'm sorry. Gosh, why, do, why are we recording these things? Okay, so for the sake of vocabulary, it's important to say gifts, and those are kind of like the fundamentals um, of living in the image and likeness of God, according to our dignity. The fruits, those things which come forth when we nurture the gifts. At the end of the day, is God going to be like, you know, you put it in the wrong category. So I don't know what to do with that. Uh, probably. He's probably going to say that. So, memorize. I'm just kidding. That's terrible. <laughs> Um, no, he's not going to say that. Of course not. Um, but we're given these things um, primarily in, in the scriptures um, and the work for humans. We're meant to learn with the senses and the intellect and things like that. Um, I say all that for the sake of the next, the next point, the charisms. The gifts, the fruits, the charisms. The charisms are individual talents. Individual talents. Individual graces. One of the reasons I said all that about language is because the word charism means gift. And so does the word grace. <laughs> so there. <laughs> but for the sake of understanding how the Holy Spirit works and how he's revealed that he works. And charism. Individual graces or gifts or talents that the Lord gives to each one of us. And each one of us, in many different ways, naturally, supernaturally, some ordinary, some extraordinary. Each one of us has a cocktail 
of charisms. Each one of us has a cocktail. And it's a big mix. Has anybody here ever taken the Myers Briggs test? Yeah, so what personality type do you have? The, the more basic type of personality distinction is introvert. You got that? Good. That's not a word. I just made that up. <laughs> introvert or extrovert. Uh, introvert or extrovert. Ambivert is also a thing, but that's all. Anyway, whatever. Uh, introvert and extrovert. Um, one basic definition of those are is, is kind of how you get charged up. How, how emotionally you, you become a little more fulfilled or energized. An introvert will uh, become more energized by stepping back and um, having some solitude or, or some sort of um, some sort of alone, and that gets charged to go. An extrovert will, will get charged or energized by being around people and interacting with people. Okay, that's actually not the deepest definition of those things, but it's part of it. Uh, an introvert, in order to become or come to a conviction of of something as as true, or we're to come to a decision, um, will take a little bit of time to receive data from the outside and take it and then absorb it and sit on it for days and weeks. <laughs> it's a matter of processing. It's a matter of coming to a decision of an action or coming to a conviction about what is true. Like you take a little bit in and then you absorb it, intra, intra. An extrovert will take something, an idea or a plan that's half formed and process it externally. Process it externally. I'm an extrovert. I was born an extrovert. I will never not be an extrovert. Right? So when I make a decision, when I make a decision, I speak a half-formed idea, or I speak a half-formed plan, and then in conversation with people that I trust on the topic, over time I come to an understanding, stronger conviction, stronger decision. What's better? What's more mature? What's more helpful? What's more collaborative? What's more reflective? Well. What's a better fruit, an apple or an orange? The both fruit? I know that's another list, whatever, okay, fine. Uh, but um, what's better? Well, well, neither. It's actually a matter of, of wiring. The hardware is different. The hardware is different. It's kind of like this with the charisms. Each one of us has a cocktail of charisms that we're better at, that the Lord has given to us specifically, and that when we use, make us happy, and bring life to others. What's the best charism? They're all. The best charism is the one from the Holy Spirit. There, there's that. The advocate and the accuser. If I forget, I can, I can accuse an introvert of not wanting to be collaborative. You're doing that because you're bad. Or an introvert can accuse an extrovert, you're doing that because you're shallow. Didn't that just get real? Love your neighbor as yourself. But understand that it's different wiring. In order to mature, should an extrovert become a little more introverted? Of course. Yeah, and over the years, this is where the term ambivert comes in, anyways. Over the years, I've definitely needed to treasure solitude. And I do. I do. I need it. But I will never not be. 
an extrovert. In order to mature, an introvert needs to process outside of himself or herself a little more. But the hardware doesn't change. It just grows and matures. There are, are authentic differences. We're not talking about faith and morals. We're not talking about, well, some people think it's wrong to lie, and some people think it's okay to lie. And look, see, it's all kind of, it's not. It's not the same. We're not talking about relativism. We're talking about authentic diversity, authentic differences. And even in terms of virtue and sin, don't imitate the accuser. Even if you have, have to have a tough conversation. But especially in terms of charisms and how we're wired in this cocktail. So, so uh, charism is a specific gift or talent or grace given to individuals. There are also ordinary and extraordinary charisms. So I'll take you to look at that. Look at that list. It's not, it's not complete. These things are things that are drawn from the scriptures, mainly the writings of St. Paul. St. Paul will also talk about the gift of human tongues and the gift of angelic tongues, the interpretation of tongues. Understanding of which the charismatic movement has given to the church in the last 50 years. And there are some charisms that are ordinary. And this means kind of ordinary by human standards. By human standards. We'll talk about how to discern charisms, how to understand what charisms the Lord has given to each one of us. But some of those are ordinary by human standards. At Our Lady of Perpetual Help, where I was the associate pastor um, while working um, at UMBC, uh, this is in Ellicott City in, in Catonsville. Um, so it was my office in the, in the parish office, and then right across the hallway was the, uh, the business manager the parish administrator. Her name was Lisa. And Lisa flourished in organizing things. And she was excellent at it, and it gave her joy. Anybody who's worked with me for more than 42 seconds knows that I will never be described as someone who flourishes in organizing things by any stretch of the imagination. So Lisa, her part of the body of Christ in building up the church in the world, had a specific charism of administration, which St. Paul says this is charism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know this now, but over the years, Lisa has been put into, to kind of tease out the analogy, um, put into a different situation where she's been able to present publicly. And she can, and she does, and she does very well. Right? But she will always feel more comfortable. It's the one who's organizing. Right? One who's organizing. Um, so that's an ordinary comparison. There are extraordinary charisms that have to do with the life of the church. So for example, there's a faith that we all have and that we're given at baptism. The conviction of the invisible. A conviction of the invisible. And then there's a charism of faith. There are no certain people who, who have such a strong driving conviction 
of the providence of God that's, that's consistent. That's different than the faith all of us are given. That's a specific charism. Charism of faith. You look at the third column on your list, or this right here, the charism of service. We're all called to serve. We're all called to serve. We're all called to serve the needy. Most of the time that's in very ordinary ways and in ways that to the outside world may be inspiring but really not going to be written about throughout the world. Like somebody serving a sick relative or something like that. Like that's, that's the call from baptism that we all have. There's a difference between that and Mother Teresa who, who for her entire life without feeling it had driven, loving, cheerful service to the most neglected in the world. There's, there's a difference. She has a specific charism. A specific charism. Um, if you're married, you don't have the charism of celibacy. <laughs> For example, right? This is an extraordinary... Uh, gift that the Lord gives certain men and women. Like, we're not bachelors or bachelorettes. It's not like, woo, we're single. We can't pick up. There's a, there's a specific charism that I've been given in my vocation. I'd like to point out this charism of voluntary poverty. I'm going to give you a little history lesson here. Because I'm a dork. <laughs> I, I, I could get out of this without giving you a history lesson. We're all called to trust in God. And because of that, we're all called to have, according to our state in life, a certain level of simplicity is one way of putting it. We're all called to give to the poor in one way or another. And that's going to look different according to a person's job and background, whatever. Like it just, but we're not called to be run by accumulation of money or material wealth. Why? Because we're Christians. That's for everyone. Don't be a materialist. Or don't be materialistic. Why? Because you have some special gift of not being materialistic? No, because you're a Christian. And again, that's going to look different for everybody. That's something for everybody. There are certain men and women, though, who are called to live below normal need and to live as beggars. And to live as beggars. And that's a sign to the world, a sign to the world that well, man does not live by bread alone. Like if, you, if you see, for example, the community of the Friars of the Renewal in the Bronx, they live poor lives with the poor. They're the Friars and Sisters. And to the world, it's, it's just crazy. Now, to a person who is Christian and living a good Christian life and not being materialistic, that's going to be inspiring. But you see a group of grown men and women living in voluntary poverty in the Bronx, serving the poor with the poor, and you see their level of consistent joy. That's going to shine for everybody. That's going to shine for everybody. And that's going to shine for Christians, that's going to shine for the entire world. That's going to be inspiring. Not that living a, a normal Christian, non-material life, non-materialistic life isn't inspiring. It is. And it's hard and it takes muscle. But there's a specific charism. There's a specific gift that they've been given. Best example is St. Francis of Assisi. Or one of the best examples, St. Francis of Assisi. 
They were called the Baker Monks. And they had joy, and it was contagious. By the time Francis died, he was like 43 or something. There were at least 5,000 friars throughout Europe living in voluntary poverty with joy into an age that was obsessed with more money and more material goods. That's one of the main reasons why they changed the face of the world. They changed the church. They changed the world that was in front of them. So you see something like that and it's so radical. Like, whoa, well maybe, maybe my goal shouldn't be just to make more money. Maybe there's something else. They have joy. They have these. And really, they have this specific charism of voluntary poverty. <clears throat> Francis died in the early 13th century, two generations after Francis, two generations of friars. Uh, there was a group of Franciscans who began to teach that voluntary poverty wasn't an individual charism, but was a matter of our baptism. They began to teach that voluntary poverty wasn't an individual charism that they had, but was something that every Christian by virtue of his or her baptism was called to live. Wow, it was a disaster. It was a total disaster. The accuser had a field day. You're not living this. You don't think you can live this. You don't feel joy living this. That means you're bad. That means you're not living out your Christian life. That means you're not living out your baptism. Should have read the list. <laughs> this is why we have these things. When we confuse that, we, we get all sorts of messed up. We get all sorts of messed up. And so there are different ordinary charisms that people have, they flourish. There are certain things that are a matter of living a decent human life. For example, I can't be like, you know what, I don't have the special charism of administration. I don't need to clean my desk. I need to clean my desk. But there are certain charisms that are individual. Once we switch that, we get into all sorts of trouble. Celibacy, this extraordinary faith, voluntary poverty, tongues are in that category. Missionary life, like that's not that we're all called to be mission, like called to be on mission and make disciples, we are. Uh, but some, some people have been given a very specific gift to have peace in a completely different culture. That's what we're talking about. It's very important that we get this. And so, to go through and to ask the question, what charisms do you think the Lord has given you? What charisms? And the more we, we open ourselves, the more we reflect and ask for the gift of wisdom, which is one of the ordinary gifts that we all have, the virtue of our baptism, <laughs> well, then we can understand. Then we can understand. And the more we receive the Holy Spirit, not only the more are we open to whatever gifts or charisms that he's given us, but we're more open to love. We're more open to love, and we're more open to understanding that, that the Lord has given different people certain gifts, and, and actually hasn't given people certain gifts. The gift of healing. Sometimes, if healing is prayed for, and the prayer isn't answered, it's because the people close themselves off to trusting God, and close themselves off to the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes. Most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time, the Lord has chosen to not heal a person in a miraculous way. But wow. Wow. 
the advocate and the accuser. You're sick, you haven't been healed, it's because you're bad. You're not a good fault. It's so wicked. But the advocate, stir the heart and trust. Trust that these things, whether they're ordinary or extraordinary or whatever, that the Lord is working and works with the entire body of Christ. And when I become who I'm created to be and you become who you're created to be, again, I still need to clean my desk. But I can ask Barbara to help me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Barbara, anyway, sorry. <laughs> poor woman. She has to pray for the people who have to work with me. Always. Oh, okay, good. Uh, So discernment, discernment, I'm going to give you a resource on how to discern. It's from the Catherine Siena Institute in, in Denver. Denver. It's called the Calling Gifted Workshop. They have individual um, offerings that you can sign up for yourself. Eventually, I like to have them out here to give a workshop. way down the road. But the discernment of charisms, what produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit? When, when I realized, when I realized that the things that I'm good at, not forever, <laughs> the things that I'm real good at, that brought me joy and fulfillment, or because God had called me to do that. It was like this powerful moment. And actually it was part of this whole situation in, in Ellicott City. I was talking to my pastor and our youth minister and we were talking about evangelization and how the church has evangelized throughout the years and how good it would be to kind of put on some sort of, I don't know, course, something like this, like how the church has evangelized, how do the Franciscans evangelize, what does it mean for each one of us to spread the gospel? And it was a great question, a great conversation, and then we started talking about the nuts and bolts, how it, how it would actually happen, how it would schedule it, where it would be, what would be needed to plan, and advertise, and I felt my heart came. Okay. okay, I'm in it, and I know I'm part of it, so, but uh, wow, this stuff makes me nervous. Uh, and then I said to my pastor, Would you like me to come up with a curriculum? And he was like, Yeah, that'll be great. You know, see what, see what you sit down with. And, my heart leapt. I went back to my room. We're at a conference. I went back to my room in the hotel. In two hours, I had four sessions. I poured out everything in my heart from history and everything I love learning, everything that's inspired me. We had to scale it down. <laughs> but I was filled with joy and I was filled with life, and it was such a difference. And then across the hall, there's the parish administrator who is flourishing. Why? Because she was coming up with a historical curriculum about how the church was evangelized throughout the... You no. Know, because she was coming up with a participant requirement list <laughs> and <laughs> scheduling which room it's going to be in and knowing that that contributed to making this entire thing happen. What an awesome thing. We could have accused each other, right? You don't want to do any of the work. You don't care about the deeper things. You, you. You're not like me because you're bad. What a mess. We didn't do that, fortunately. We didn't do that. So right now I'd like you to take a minute or so, be quiet, reflect on the question, what about the charisms 
stands out as especially important or challenging? What charisms do you think the Lord has given you? All right. Um, on the resource sheet, the third one down, St. Catherine of Siena Institute. We did such a cursory, believe it or not, um, teaching on the charisms, uh, but they are a great resource. And they go into the... the, the Which ones on the list can be both for everybody and then individually in a very powerful way? If you, if you leave here knowing that that distinction exists, I will have done my job. Okay, so for example, mercy. I don't have the charisma of mercy. I could be you know, unforgiving and begrudging, you know, right? But there are the works of mercy. Mother Teresa. Again, it's, it's such a, to me, it's such a good example. We're all called to serve. We are a brother's keeper. We're not all called to be missionary charity of nuns. I personally know that I'm not called to be a missionary charity of nuns. Yes. Yes. Yes, um, and, and I've done that. I've done that for me personally and done that for others. Um, the staff wouldn't know it. Again, it's kind of an easy target for me in administration. The staff wouldn't know it, but I have prayed for that gift for me. Friends, it could be worse. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the, the way that, one, one of the ways that I've seen Again, just kind of in my own limited way, the, the Lord answer those prayers is to kind of say, okay, oh, you know, for time or for something. Like, this is never going to come naturally, but help you out here a little bit. Um, I feel like all of us have a little bit of rewiring to do when it comes to this. Um, we can talk about love of neighbor, but the command is love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor and yourself. Right. And so there's a there's a big difference between me saying this doesn't come naturally to me and this is not a specific charism the Lord has given me, but I'm one member of the entire body of Christ. And so I'll put some muscle in, but then I also have to nurture what I think. And when my lack of this gift or this charism, when that comes forth, I need to work on it. Uh, but I can't condemn myself. I can't act as the accuser. I can't act as the accuser. And sometimes the language gets mixed up. Did you read an act of contrition that says, I accuse myself? Well. I don't know. I don't really like that one, frankly. <laughs> so, so somebody could say that and mean I'm, I'm good and made in the image and likeness of God and I accuse myself of doing this wrong thing. Okay. I think it's, a, it's an easy bridge to and I'm bad or I've somehow lost hope. With, uh, with St. Catherine of Siena Institute, it does, it, it gives a couple more distinctions within the lists. Ordinary, extraordinary, that kind of thing. Um, again, if you leave here knowing that that distinction exists, I think, I think that's uh, very important. The word love means a billion things 
when we're using it correctly. I love my sister. I love pizza. <laughs> it's the same word. But I'm using it. Obviously. Hopefully, right? <laughs> um, but it can get all, all sorts of messed up. And that's kind of depending on our wounds sometimes, and our fears, our particular sins that we deal with, the particular way that we are selfish, that kind of thing, we kind of mess up. Sometimes if the only definition we have of love is like tough love and need to challenge somebody out of, out of error, well, that's part of love, but if that's the only one, well, that's not, that's not good. And sometimes if the only definition of love is like kind of a gentle non-challenge because we need to make sure the person knows that we're not condemning them. Well, if that's the only thing, well, that's not, that's not good either. I mean, love, love is hard. You all, you all know that. Anybody who's been in a, any kind of relationship for more than 30 seconds knows that love is, is a challenge and it takes perseverance. Um, and so it's, it's frankly easier to say, well, love means I need to challenge, or love means I need to be gentle. Or love means everything is a sin. That's not right. Or love means there's no such thing as sin. Well, that's not right either. Real love is hard. And that doesn't mean it's always a burden, but it takes muscle. And when you get into it, it's radical. When you get into it, this is the reason why Jesus gave us the Eucharist. When you get into it, this is why Jesus gave us the magisterium of the church, faith and morals of the church. When you get into it, this is why Jesus gives us the command of the works of mercy. When you get into it, this is why the Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures in the church to make distinctions between what we're all called to and what we each individually are, are called to. When you get into it, this is why Jesus gave us confession. Because with, without, without these things, and this is the real challenge, when we do declare ourselves not in need of something that the Lord has given us, we're, we're in one way or another lacking love. But when we pursue, when we're faithful to what the church teaches in faith and morals, and we're faithful to the sacraments and the works of mercy and the call to repent, not if, but when we fall short. The Holy Spirit works within us day in and day out. Creates us. He makes us who we're meant to be. He heals wounds. It's a long distance race. But this is why we have these things. So that he can convince us that we are his, his beloved he can convince us that, that love is worthy of the sacrifice, whether it's the soft, more compassionate version, or the, the tougher, more challenging version, or trying to figure out how to do both at the same time. You look at these uh, resources, again, a very um, incomplete list. Uh, Karen and Rachel and I had a webinar today with some a representative from form.org. There were several times in that webinar where we cheered um, and kind of, well, in my case at least, probably an awkward and embarrassing way in a professional webinar. But anyway, um, but I would encourage you to dive into that and just, just look at what's available. Uh, different movies and resources and series and talk short and long, whatever. Um, in every part of our Catholic Christian life, it's this vast treasure chest, and each jewel is multifaceted. And the Lord is always inviting us deeper and deeper. I think, uh, well, Okay. Um, if I don't have your email, please give me your email, and I'll 
Last, uh, last time I made the joke that I'll send you pictures and memes of cats, and everybody thought that was fun that was funny, so I'll say that again. Uh, if you give me your email, I'll send you memes of cats. Huh? Yeah, sure. Who are you Ha ha ha! Father, you're so funny. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mary, Mother of God, and Mother of the Church, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all very much.